and to start recording it as well as we let the next family in. Super, super. Okay. All right, I think we handed all the technical stuff. I'll get my little guy up here so we can see him a little bit better. So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here for the third and last of this particular series of read-ups, the a Christmas Carol. So tonight we will read the culmination of this classic, this Christmas classic, or actually Ben will do the reading and I'll just do the listening and enjoyment as well along with the rest of, rest of you. And we not quite sure about the timeline. We think we can get it all in. Um, and if not, we will run a little bit over and we're encouraging you to hang in there with us. Um, and if you do need to leave, then you will be able to check the last part of it by way of the recording zip so will be out probably by this time uh, tomorrow evening itself. So without any further ado, let me introduce you to our, um, our little elf, <laughs> Ben Fife, who will begin the readings for this evening. I hope that wasn't like a short joke or something. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm, will, I'm five I, seven, which is the international average height for men. <laughs> okay. I, I, you know, anyway, Ben and I have never met, so I I thought I thought he was six foot three. I, I, so. My dad was. <laughs> Once we get started, I will be um, uh, muting everybody, and uh, in fact, I'm gonna. If I can do that now. We'll do that. Oh, before I do that, I want to make Ben the co-hosts that way he can unmute himself something we failed to do last time okay and i also like to just take the moment to welcome my wife who's normally it has a seminar that. on this evening and she doesn't tonight so she's joining us as well hey, okay Ann. we hear a lots of good stuff about you Ann. <laughs> thank you thank you wendy thank you for saying that <laughs> Do I get a free coaching now? <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you later. Don't worry. Just okay. tease it. Just tease it. <laughs> we'll take a moment to mute everybody, and then Ben will unmute himself, and we'll get going. Here we go. Uh -huh. We last left Ebenezer Scrooge upon a ship in the ocean with the ghost of Christmas past. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while thus engaged, to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's, and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room, with the spirit standing smiling by his side, and looking at that same nephew with approving affability. Ha <laughs> ha laughed Scrooge's nephew. <laughs> It is a fair, even-handed, noble adjustment of things, that while there is infection in disease and sorrow, there is nothing in the world so irresistibly contagious as laughter and good humor. When Scrooge's nephew laughed in this way, holding his sides, rolling his head, and twisting his face into the most extravagant contortions, Scrooge's niece, by marriage, laughed as heartily as he and their assembled friends, being not a bit behindhand, roared out lustily. <laughs> he said that Christmas was a humbug as I live, cried Scrooge's nephew. He believed it too. More shame for him, Fred, said Scrooge's niece, indignantly. She was very pretty, exceedingly pretty, with a dimpled, surprised-looking, capital face a ripe little mouth that seemed to be made to be kissed, as no doubt it was, and the sunniest pair of eyes you ever saw in any little creature's head. Altogether she was what you would have called provoking, you know, but satisfactory too. Oh, perfectly satisfactory. He's a comical old fellow, said Scrooge's nephew. That's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred, hinted Scrooge's niece. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear, said Scrooge's nephew. His wealth is of no use to him. He don't do any good with it. He don't make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking <laughs> that he is ever going to benefit us with it. I have no patience with him, 
observed Scrooge's niece. Scrooge's niece's sisters and all the other ladies expressed the same opinion. Oh, I have, said Scrooge's nephew. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. The consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his mouldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year, and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. It was their turn to laugh now at the notion of his shaking Scrooge. But being thoroughly good-natured, and not much caring what they laughed at, so that they laughed at any rate, he encouraged them in their merriment, and passed the bottle joyously. After tea they had some music, for they were a musical family, and knew what they were about when they sung a glee or a catch, I can assure you. Scrooge's niece played well upon the harp, and played, among other tunes, a simple little air which had been familiar to the child who fetched Scrooge from the boarding school. When this strain of music sounded, all the things that ghost had shown him came upon his mind. He softened more and more, and thought that if he could have listened to it often, years ago, he might have cultivated the, kindness, the kindnesses of life for his own happiness, with his own hands, without resorting to the sexton spade that buried Jacob Marley. But they didn't devote the whole evening to music. After a while they played at forfeits, for it is good to be children sometimes, and never better than at Christmas time, when its mighty founder was a child himself. Stop! There was first a game at Blind Man's Buff. Of course there was, and I no more believe Topper was really blind than I believe he had eyes in his boots. My opinion is that it was a done thing between him and Scrooge's nephew, and the ghost of Christmas present knew it. The way he went after that plump sister in the lace-tucker was an outrage on the credulity of human nature, knocking down the fire-irons, tumbling over the chairs, bumping against the piano, smothering himself against the curtains. Wherever she went, there went he. He always knew where the plump sister was. He wouldn't catch anybody else. If you had fallen up against him, as some of them did, on purpose, he would have made a feint of endeavouring to seize you, which would have been an affront to your understanding, and would instantly have sidled off in the direction of the plump sister. She often cried out that it wasn't fair, and it really was not. But when at last he caught her, when he caught her into a corner, whence there was no escape, then his, con his conduct was the most execrable. For his pretending not to know her, his pretending that it was necessary to touch her headdress, and further to assure himself of, his, of her identity by pressing a certain ring upon her finger, was vile, monstrous. No doubt she told him her opinion of it, when, another blind man being in office, they were so very confidential together behind the curtains. Scrooge's niece was not one of the blind man's buff party, but was made comfortable with a large chair and a footstool in a snug corner where the ghost and Scrooge were close behind her. But she joined in the forfeits and loved her love to admiration with all the letters of the alphabet. There might have been twenty people there, young and old, but they all played, and so did Scrooge, for wholly forgetting in the interest he had in what was going on, that his voice made no sound in their ears, he sometimes came out with his guess quite loud, and very often guessed quite right too, for the sharpest needle warranted not to cut in the eye was not sharper than Scrooge, blunt as he took it in his head to be. The ghost was greatly pleased to find him in this mood, and looked upon him with such favour that he begged like a boy to be allowed to stay until the guests departed. But this, the spirit said, could not be done. "'Here is a new game,' said Scrooge. "'One half-hour spirit, only one.' It was a game called Yes and No, where Scrooge's nephew had to think of something, and the rest must find out what. He only answering to their questions, yes or no, as the case, as the case was. The brisk fire of questioning which he was 
exposed, elicited from him that he was thinking of an animal, a live animal, a rather disagreeable animal, a savage animal, an animal growled and grunted sometimes, and talked sometimes, and lived in London, and walked about the streets, and wasn't made a show of, and wasn't led by anybody, and didn't live in a menagerie, and was never killed in a market, and was not a horse, or an ass, or a cow, or a bull, or a tiger, or a dog, or a pig, or a cat, or a bear. At every fresh question that was put to him, this nephew burst into a fresh roar of laughter, and was so inexpressibly tickled that he was obliged to get off the sofa, get up off the sofa, <laughs> sofa and stamp. At last, the plump sister, falling into a similar state, cried out, I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. What is it? cried Fred. It's your Uncle Scrooge which it certainly was. Admiration was the universal sentiment, though some objected that the reply to, is it a bear, ought to have been, yes, inasmuch as an answer in the negative was sufficient to have diverted their thoughts from Mr. Scrooge, supposing they had ever had any tendency that way. He has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure, said Fred, and it would be ungrateful not to drink his health, here is a glass of mulled wine ready to our hand at the moment, and I say, Uncle Scrooge. Well, Uncle Scrooge, they cried. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is, said Scrooge's nephew. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless, Uncle Scrooge. Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return, and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last words spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands, and they were close at home by struggling men, and they were patient in their greater hope, by poverty, and it was rich, in almshouse, hospital, and jail, in misery's every refuge, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door, and barred the spirit out, he left his blessing, and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night, if it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this, because the ho Christmas holidays appeared to con be condensed into the space of time they passed. It was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, and noticed that its hair was grey. "'Are spirits' lives so short?' asked Scrooge. "'My life upon this globe is very brief,' replied the ghost. It ends tonight. Tonight, cried Scrooge. Tonight at midnight. Hark, the time is drawing near. The chimes were ringing the three quarters past eleven at that moment. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, said Scrooge, looking intently at the spirit's robe. But I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or or a claw. It might be a claw, for the flesh there is upon it, was the spirit's sorrowful reply. Look here. From the foldings of its robe it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, man, look here, look, look down here, exclaimed the ghost. They were a boy and a girl, yellow, meagre, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, had pinched and twisted them, and pulled them into shreds. Where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked, and glared out menacing. No change, no degradation, no perversion of humanity in any grade, through all the mysteries of wonderful creation, has monsters half so horrible and dread. Scrooge started back, appalled. Having them shown to him in this way, he tried to say they were fine children, 
but the words choked themselves rather than be parties to a lie of such enormous magnitude. Spirit, are they yours? Scrooge could say no more. They are man's, said the spirit, looking down upon them, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, and all of their degree, but most of all, beware this boy, for on his brow I see that written, which is doom, unless the writing be erased. Deny it, cried the spirit, stretching out his hand towards the city. Slander those who tell it ye, admit it for your factious purposes, and make it worse, and bide the end. Have they no refuge or resource? cried Scrooge. Are there no prisons said the spirit turning on him for the last time with his own words are there no workhouses the bell struck twelve scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not as the last stroke of twelve ceased to vibrate he remembered the prediction of old jacob marley and lifting up his eyes beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded coming like a mist along the ground towards him. Good. Just a very brief break. I want to take care of our narrator, give him opportunity to get a sip of water or whatever, and making whatever changes he needs to make for this next part. This is part four, the last of the spirits as he becomes the spirit himself. We will continue. And again, muting everybody so that our spirit can unmute himself. Continue. The phantom slowly, gray, oh wait, stay four, the last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment, which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible, save one outstretched hand. But for this, it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night and separated from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall and stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. "'I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come,' said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand." You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes intently fixed upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. Ghost of the future, he exclaimed. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. But as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand pointed straight before them. Lead on, said Scrooge. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. The city seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act. 
But there they were, in the heart of it, on change amongst the mer merchants, who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets, and conversed in groups, and looked at their watches, and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals, and so forth, as Scrooge had seen them often. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. No, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? asked a third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box. I thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first man with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excrescence on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey cock. I haven't heard, said the large man, yawning again. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. This was pleasantly received with a general laugh. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the speaker. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. Well, I am the most disinterested among you, after all, said the first speaker, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch, but I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided on into a street. Its finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He knew these men also perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy and of great importance. He had made a point of always standing well in their esteem, strictly in a business point of view. "'How are you?' said one. "'How are you?' returned the other. Well, said the first, old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? So I am told, returned the second. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable for Christmas time. You're not a skater, I suppose. No, no, something else to think of. Good morning. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to a conversation apparently so trivial but feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was the past, and this ghost's province was the future. Nor could he think of anyone immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply them, but nothing doubting that to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for his own improvement, he resolved to treasure up every word he heard, and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed, and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revol revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought and hoped he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom, with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from his thoughtful quest, he fancied from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, although he recognized its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses were wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways, like so many cesspools, disgorged their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. 
Far in this den of infamous resort, there was a low-browed beetling shop below a penthouse roof where iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were brought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinize were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupt fat, and sepulchres of bones. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in, by a charcoal stove made of old bricks, was a grey-haired rascal, nearly seventy years of age. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop. But she had scarcely entered, when another woman, similarly laden, came in too, and she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment, in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. "'Let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. "'Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. "'Look here, old Joe, here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it.' "'You couldn't have met in a better place,' said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. "'Come into the parlour. You were made free of it long ago, you know, and the other two ain't strangers.' "'Stop till I shut the door of the shop. "'Ah, how it squeaks! "'There ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place "'as its own hinges, I believe. "'And I'm sure there's no such old bones here as mine. <laughs> "'We're all suitable to our calling. "'We're well matched. "'Come into the parlour, come into the parlour. "'The parlour was the space behind the screen of rags. "'The old man raked the fire together with an old stair-rod, "'and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe, put it in his mouth again. While he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor, and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees, and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. "'What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber?' said the woman. "'Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did.' "'That's true, indeed,' said the laundress. "'No man more so.' "'Why, then, don't stand there as if you were afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose.' "'No, oh, indeed,' said Mrs. Dilber and the man together. "'We should hope not.' "'Very well, then,' cried the woman. "'That's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose.' "'No, indeed.' said Mrs. Dilber, laughing. "'If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw,' pursued the woman, "'why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his, loan, his last, all alone there by himself.' "'It's the truest word that ever was spoke,' said Mrs. Dilber. "'It was a judgment on him.' "'I wish it was a little heavier judgment,' replied the woman. "'And it should have been, you may depend on it. "'If I could have laid my hands on anything else, "'open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. "'Speak out plain. "'I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. "'We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves "'before we met here, I believe. "'It's no sin. "'Open the bundle, Joe.' "'But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this.' and the man in faded black, mounting the breach first, produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, a pair of sleeve buttons, and a brooch of no great value were all. They were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give for each upon the wall, and added them up into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. "'That's your account,' said Joe, "'and I wouldn't give another sixpence.' if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dilber was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. "'And now undo my bundle, Joe,' 
said the first woman. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. What do you call this? said Joe. Bed curtains? Ah, returned the woman, laughing and leaning forwards on her crossed arms. Bed curtains! You don't mean to say you took them down rings and all with him lying there? said Joe. Yes, I do replied the woman. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, said Joe, and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold out my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching out for the sake of a man such as he was. I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coolly. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? asked Joe. Whose else's do you think? replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? said old Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if I did. Ah, uh, You may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one, too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. As they grouped about their spoil, in the scanty light afforded by the old man's lamp, he viewed them with a detestation and disgust, which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. <laughs> laughed the same woman, when old Joe, producing a flannel bag with money in it, told out their several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive to profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, said Scrooge, shuddering from his head to his foot. I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life turns that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay something covered up, which, though it was dumb, announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light, rising in the outer air, fell straight upon the bed, and on it, plundered and bereft, Unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger on Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, and longed to do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the spectre at his side. O oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death, set up thine altar here, and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. But of the loved, revered, and honoured head, thou canst not turn one hair to thy dread purposes, or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It was not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, and generous and true, the heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice? Hard-dealing? Griping cares? They have brought him to a rich end, truly. He lay in the dark empty house with not a man, a woman, or a child to say that he was kind to me in this or that, and for the memory of one kind word, I will be kind to him. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit, 
I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment, like a wing, and withdrawing it, revealed a room where by daylight a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, starting at every sound, looked out at the window. At length the long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight of which he felt ashamed, and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, and when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good, she said, or bad, to help him? Bad, he answered. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said, amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face, if her face spoke the truth. But she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands. She prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry, but the first was the emotion of her heart. What the half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me, when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know, but before that time we shall be ready with the money, and even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find someone so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. Yes, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they so little understood, were brighter, and it was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that, that the ghost could show him caused by the event was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will be forever present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. <clears throat> they entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before and found the mother and the children seated round the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were very quiet. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them, the boy must have read them out, as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table, and put her hand to her face. The colour hurts me eyes, she said. The colour. Ah, oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. They were very quiet again. At last she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice, that only faltered once, I have known him to walk with... I have known him to walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. And so have I, cried Peter, often. And so have I. Excla exclaimed another, so had all. But he was very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble, no trouble. And there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow. 
came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each a little hat, a ch each child, a little cheek against his face, as if they said, Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They would be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert? said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised them that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child, cried Bob. My little child. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down on it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened, and went down again quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who, meeting him in the street that day, and seeing that he looked a little, just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what had happened to distress him. On which, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now, it wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Mrs. Cratchit. You would be surer of it, my dear, returned Bob, if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised, mark what I say, if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Mrs. Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company in with someone and getting and setting up for himself. Get along with you retorted Peter, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob, one of these days, though there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor tiny Tim, shall we, or this first parting that there was among us. Never, father, cried they all. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor Tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried. I am very happy, said little Bob. I am very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him, and his daughters kissed him. The two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of Tiny Tim, thy childish essence was from God. Spectre, said Scrooge. Something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before, though at a different time, he thought, indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the end just now desired until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now, is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house. Let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The house is yonder, Scrooge exclaimed. Why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The phantom pointed as before. He joined it once again, and wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until they reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. A churchyard. 
Here, then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life, choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. "'Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point,' said Scrooge, "'answer me one question. Are these the shadows of things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only?' Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. "'Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead,' said Scrooge. "'But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me.' The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. "'Am I that man who lay upon the bed?' he cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, spirit! Oh, no, no! The finger was still there. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me! I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit! he pursued, as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Assure me that I may yet change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honour Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Okay, anyone who would care to unmute, um, we are at a very brief break as we go to the end. Uh, actually, the title is The End of It. I um, want to thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, we will have a few very brief uh, announcements as to what's to follow here in uh, 2021. Is there anybody here who's not excited about starting a new year? <laughs> I don't know who it would be. Um, so we will finish the last portion here, just the last few sections here. Um, as we break through the darkness of that last set of scenes and come back to the light. Uh, that's also the light in uh, uh, Ben's room as well. And then we will have the announcements and have time like you did last week for any uh, questions and answers or comments that you care to make to either myself or to Benny. So with that, um, why don't we go ahead and continue? Uh, and let's, again, if anybody wants to say anything now before we uh, go back, we can do that as well. So, I just want to say fabulous. I love it. <laughs> Very good, very good. Yes, ditto. <laughs> yes, I agree. It's awesome. Very cool. Good, good reviews here, Ben. <laughs> let's let's bring it on home. I will mute everybody again, and then you can unmute, and we will continue. Stave five. The end of it. Yes, and the bedpost was his own, the bed was his own, the room was his own, best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own, to make amends in. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, 
Scrooge repeated as he scrambled out of bed. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. He was so fluttered and so glowing with his good intentions that this broke that his broken voice would scarcely answer to his call. He had been sobbing violently in his conflict with the spirit, and his face was wet with tears. They are not torn down cried Scrooge, folding one of his bed curtains in his arms. They are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. His hands were busy with his garments all this time, turning them inside out, putting them on upside down, tearing them, mislaying them, making them parties to every kind of extravagance. I don't know what to do cried Scrooge, laughing and crying in the same breath. I am as light as a feather, I am happy as an angel, I am as merry as a schoolboy, I am as drink giddy as a drunken man. A merry Christmas to everybody, a happy new year to all the world. Hello here, hope, hello! He had frisked into the sitting room and was now standing there, perfectly winded. There's the saucepan that the gruel was in cried Scrooge, starting off again and going round the fireplace. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas Present sat. There's the window where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> really, for a man who had been out of practice for so many years, it was a splendid laugh, a most illustrious laugh, the father of a long, long line of brilliant laughs. I don't know what day of the month it is, said Scrooge. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello, whoop, hello here. He was checked in his transports by the ch churches ringing out the lustiest peals he had ever heard. Clash, clang, hammer, ding, dong, bell, bell, dong, ding, hammer, clang, clash. Oh, glorious, glorious. Running to the window, he opened it and put out his head. No fog, no mist, clear, bright, jovial stirring, cold, cold, piping for the blood to dance to, golden sunlight, heavenly sky, sweet fresh air, merry bells, oh, glorious, glorious. What's today? cried Scrooge, calling downward to a boy in Sunday clothes, who perhaps had loitered in to look about him. Eh? returned the boy, with all his might of wonder. What's today, my fine fellow? said Scrooge. Today? replied the boy. Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day, said Scrooge to himself. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello, returned the boy. Do you know the poulterers in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did, replied the lad. An intelligent boy, said Scrooge. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big one. What, the one as big as me? returned the boy. What a delightful boy, said Scrooge. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, replied the boy. Is it? said Scrooge. Go and buy it. Walk, uh, exclaimed the boy. No, no, said Scrooge. I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell them to bring it here, that I may give them the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. The boy was off like a shot. He must have had a steady hand at a trigger who could have got a shot off half so fast. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit's, whispered Scrooge, rubbing his hands and splitting with a laugh. He shan't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's would be. The hand in which he wrote the address was not a steady one, but write it he did somehow, and went downstairs to open the street door, ready for the coming of the poulterer's man. As he stood there waiting his arrival, the knocker caught his eye. I shall love it as long as I live cried Scrooge, patting it with his hand. I scarcely ever looked at it before. What an honest expression it has in its face. It's a wonderful knocker. Here's the turkey. Hello, Hope, how are you? Merry Christmas. It was a turkey. He never could have stood upon his legs, that bird. He would have snapped him short off in a minute, like sticks of sealing wax. Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town, said Scrooge. You must have a cab. 
the chuckle with which he said this and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckled till he cried. Shaving was not an easy task, for his hand continued to shake very much, and shaving requires attention even when you don't dance while you're at it. But if he had cut off the end of his nose, he would have put a piece of sticking plaster over it and been quite satisfied. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas past ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delighted smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant, in a word, that three or four good-humoured fellows said, Good morning, sir, a Merry Christmas to you. And Scrooge often said afterwards that of all the blithe sounds he had ever heard, those were the blithest in his ears. He had not gone far when coming on towards him, he beheld the portly gentleman who had walked into his counting-house the day before, and said, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. It sent a pang across his heart to think how this old gentleman would look upon him when they met, but he knew what path lay straight before him, and he took it. My dear sir, said Scrooge, quickening his pace, and taking the old gentleman by both his hands, how do you do? I hope you succeeded yesterday. It was very kind of you. A Merry Christmas to you. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, said Scrooge. That is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness? Here Scrooge whispered in his ear. Lord, bless me, cried the gentleman, as if his breath were taken away. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? "'If you please,' said Scrooge, "'not a farthing less. "'A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. "'Will you do me that favour? "'My dear sir,' said the other, shaking hands with him, "'I don't know what to say to such munific—' "'Don't say anything, please,' retorted Scrooge. "'Come and see me. "'Will you come and see me?' "'I will,' cried the old gentleman, "'and it was clear he meant to do it. "'Thank ye," said Scrooge. "'I am much obliged to you. Thank you fifty times. Bless you. He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. He had never dreamed that any walk, that anything could give him so much happiness. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. He passed the door a dozen times before he had the courage to go up and knock. But he made a dash and did it. "'Is your master at home, my dear?' said Scrooge to the girl. "'Very nice girl.' "'Yes, sir. Where is he, my love?' said Scrooge. "'He's in the dining-room, sir, along with the mistress. I'll show you upstairs, if you please.' "'Thank you. He knows me,' said Scrooge, with his hand already on the dining-room lock. "'I'll go in, my dear.' He turned it gently and sidled his face in round the door. They were looking at the table, which was spread out in great array, for these young housekeepers are always nervous on such points. Fred, said Scrooge, dear heart alive, how his niece by marriage started. Scrooge had forgotten for the moment about her sitting on the corner with the footstool, or he wouldn't have done it on any account. Why, bless my soul, cried Fred, who's that? It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. I've come to dinner. Will you let me in, Fred? Let him in. It is a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. The quarter past. No Bob. He was full eighteen minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come into the tank. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter, too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Hello! growled Scrooge, in his accustomed voice, as near as he could feign it. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? 
I am very sorry, sir, said Bob. I am behind my time. You are, repeated Scrooge. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir, pleaded Bob, appearing from the tank. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday. Now I'll tell you what, my friend, said Scrooge. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, he continued, leaping from his stool and giving Bob such a dig in the waistcoat that he staggered back into the tank again. And therefore, I am about to raise your salary. Bob trembled and got a little nearer to the ruler. He had a momentary idea of knocking Scrooge down with it, holding him and calling to the people in the court for help and a straight waistcoat. A Merry Christmas, Bob, said Scrooge, with an earnestness that could not be mistaken. As he clapped him on the back, a merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary and endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we will discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset. And knowing that such as these would be blind anyway, he thought it quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes in grins as to have the malady in less attractive forms. His own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. Very good. That's the end. And a happy ending. It definitely was. Um, there's a couple things I want to share, but I want to give everybody the opportunity to unmute and let's give our uh, illustrious audiobook, audiobook narrator a round of applause. Thank you so much for doing such a good job. Awesome. Thank you for listening. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Bravo. It was awesome. Very well done. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ben. Oh. A gallery view so I can see everybody. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, great job, Ben. Very, very nice. Awesome job. A Merry Christmas to all of you. Yes. Merry Christmas yes. to you. We do have a couple quick announcements before I forget it, since this one's a little bit uh, in a different location. Um, I do want to let you know that uh, Journey of the Kings which is uh, by, uh, I'm probably, see if I get this name correctly, Gary. Gary Delfino. Delfino. Yeah. This is a book that's narrated by Ben himself, who will be releasing on Christmas Eve, just around the corner on Audible. And it's a dramatization of the journey of the wise men. So it'd be a perfect Ooh. time, yeah. perfect spirit for the season itself. So that will be available. Awesome. Uh, on Christmas Eve via Audible itself. So we've been told. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see. Hopefully, our fingers crossed. I'm going to also scroll this down here for just a moment. And we did find a uh, slightly reduced, uh, condensed version of the book in case some of your friends said, you know, really three hours listening is a little bit too long. I'm trying to share my screen here. Here we go. What time does it start, Benny? The the Journey of the Kings. It's a, it, it'll just be uh, available to purchase on Audible. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Great, perfect. So. Okay. 
Would you like me to read the abridged version here? <laughs> yes, if you would read the abridged version of A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, abridged. Christmas sucks. You suck. Yay, Christmas! <laughs> there we go. Love it. Oh, God. Now, well, this the, might that... sound like a silly question, Benny, but how would I uh, go about uh, checking that audio book out? Um, you'd, you'd need to have an account on Audible. Um, so it's not something so much that can be checked out, but I will have um, some free codes for it. If you want to, uh, you can go to my website, bennyfifeaudio.com, and I would be happy to, like, if you just send me your email, then I'll, uh, once I have the free codes for it, I'll send you a free code for it. Oh, okay, good. So, Yeah, very good. That would be awesome, Benny. Mm -hmm. So in the new year... Um, one of the things that we have here, let me just make sure I'm going in the right order here. Yeah. So these are some additional um, of the original illustrations that was in the original uh, Christmas Carol. Uh, they are not on the website yet, but they will be um, before the end of this week. If you are, want to download any of those and to print them out for their own beauty or also use them as coloring pages, you know, with yourself or your kids. They will be available um, before Christmas Day itself. Um, what's next? Uh, this is a little bit of a change. Uh, we are, you know, this is the, the last of obviously of a Christmas Carol, but the read-ups will continue at least uh, through this first quarter and perhaps you know into the year. That's really our intention is to keep providing this for people. Uh, one of the next things that we'll be doing, which will not be next week, which we originally planned, I'm going to give uh, Ben um, time to have let his voice recuperate a little bit and me to recuperate a little bit as well. The next read up though of the Zach Bates Eco Adventure read up is going to be January the 5th, the following Tuesday from 7 to 8. And registration is now open. If you want to register for that, go to wbradfordswift.com forward slash read up. Um, and we will be, there is also a pretty complete, not completely complete, but pretty complete uh, recap of the book as we've covered so far. So if you join this, even if you haven't been on the other read-ups, you'll have a good idea of where the book is going and you know we'll be picking it up there. Our intention is to finish this book, The Minion Overall, the first book in the series, by the one following that. So two weeks after that will be um, a follow-up um, I believe it's about two weeks. I don't remember exactly on the date, but we will uh, be sure to get those dates to you. We'll be finishing up the Zach Bakes Eco Adventure. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, really quick on the Zach Bates Eco Adventure too. Yeah. Um, if uh, you want to catch up in other ways, the the audio book is free on Google Play um, for the for book one, and also I think on. Kindle or whatever you can you can get the 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 book also free that way. Yeah, so you can get the book. There's a couple of ways you can get both the audio. If you want or know somebody who wants to join the Zach Bates Eco Adventure team, um, and can, you can receive both the ebook of book one and the audio book by going to my website wbradfordswift.com, going to the home page, and this is part of our game to, to not only to inspire and encourage young people to read and to become lifelong readers by introducing them to the joy of reading for the pure pleasure of it. And our game is to give away at least a thousand books, it's ebooks and our audio books, um, you know, this year. And we'll continue to make that available uh, until at least a thousand books are given away. Um, and Junkyard Dogs is book four of the Zach Bates Eco Adventure series. It will be due out in January. I had anticipated finishing it uh, this month, but uh, 
the climactic scene is um, driving me a little bit crazy right now. It'll be well worth it, but <laughs> so many different, you know, moving parts in it right now. Uh, so it will be available, um, book four, where young empath Faith Bandera becomes the newest member of the Eco Adventure team. So that will be coming out shortly. So now I'd like to open it up. Um, let me quit sharing the screen here for just a moment. If you have any questions about any of that that I just covered, or you want to just ask or make comments to Ben or myself, I'll be happy to try to answer them, or so will Ben. Just, yes, exactly. Just raise your hand like Teresa just did. Teresa. Well, I have a question for Benjamin. What were your favorite characters to narrate in A Christmas Carol? You know, probably my very favorite is Scrooge, just because he has, he changes so much by the end. He's, I mean, he's laughing and whatever. But also, I adore doing um, Jacob Marley and the Ghost of Christmas Present. Those are my, those are my three favorites. So, mm. though, though also the scene with the, the creepy people selling the stuff. I, yeah, I, I always like doing that because uh, I, I get to roll out the cockney and get, get nice and gritty. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Very good. Great question. Um, just thank you. I'm going to say Merry Christmas. I had a call at five, but I asked to extend it so I could listen to the end. And um, I, Brad, I'm going to see if at the group home uh, we're getting a new boy and he's 16. If he's, if he's capable of uh, being able to listen, like on the computer, if they'll let me, I will uh, get him to, as long as I have permission from the ministry, I, I don't think it will be a problem at all, but That'd I be... never know the rules change, but I think it would be awesome. So I just want to really acknowledge you for, um, you know, making this available to kids and, you know, encouraging the reading. So thank you. And Merry Christmas, Anne, and everybody here. And hopefully I'll see you at another Zoom reading. <laughs> yes, I hope okay, so too. I don't, I don't have a file for it, but I do want to also mention one of the things we will be adding in January uh, and probably doing it on a, a monthly or every other month basis is where we'll, we will be doing uh, authors guest events. These will be kind of a modified uh, read up uh, we have a couple authors here that are on the Zoom tonight that we're hoping will ex uh, accept our invitation to be a part of this. Again, that information will be uh, coming available uh, with the dates and everything uh, in your uh, inbox through the emails, along with the uh, recordings of this one uh, before the, uh, you know, uh, in the next couple of days. So just stay tuned for those. And if you know of authors that you think would be interested in being a part of our uh, guest events, um, if they write uh, children and or young adult fiction, particularly fantasy and science fiction in those genres, we'd love to talk to them. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for everything. Am thank I you. allowed to ask a question? Very. Yeah. Um, Benjamin, I wanted to know if you had any uh, insights to share with us on how you went about developing the voices for A Christmas Carol. I noticed you you really gave the characters very distinct voices, and I was wondering if you had any behind the scenes stuff about that. You know, <clears throat> go back going back to high school, I studied dialects. I had a really good drama teacher in high school, and uh, that's where I I learned the initial British and Cockney. Uh, um, Uh, as far as, as I love so many film versions of A Christmas Carol, and some of them, if if you you might be able to spot the exact scene that I'm emulating, like Patrick Stewart's A Christmas Carol, I love his his portrayal of Scrooge, um, and the like the the scene with the people selling the his stuff and whatever that's that's from that one too. But but there there are other things. I mean Michael Caine, and um, it's. I, I have so many favorites. Like, I, I mean, w when I get to the, the ghost of Christmas uh, yet to come, I'm, I'm like, I, I, I want to start going, boy, um, 
Bororom for you know the the Muppet version, but really it's I, I I borrow liberally from all kinds of different sources, but it's also something where I've read this to my kids every year for ten years, and my oldest daughter was saying, you know, it's something where you could just start talking and and like oh yeah that's that's Jacob Marley's voice, <laughs> and it's, so it's kind of fun because I I've kind of I don't know if I'd say it's a rut, but I have the characters pretty well. Yeah. cast in stone at this point so that's what it sounded like yeah yeah that's nice. good also and you had a question yeah go ahead i i just wanted to say um I, this is my first opportunity to get to hear you and you are gifted this is wildly entertaining and wonderful for us to be a partake of you know and i just am grateful to have been able to be a part of it tonight so thank you very much you're very welcome and you know there's something like recording audiobooks it's all in my voice it's been it's been very fun to you know don the hat and and be the character to yes. you and i've i I, I'm, yeah. I hope that came across that it's yeah. that yeah. It, it was it was fun to be able to perform it visually as well as yes. as, as uh, yes. with my voice. So as I, I said, it was wildly I entertaining. I deeply and wonderfully enjoyed it. I can't even quite say it enough. <laughs> and don't miss next time because at the Zach Bates Eco Adventure series, he's going to dress up like Samson, the magic dog, the flying dog. So. <laughs> I don't think you. I don't sure, know if you sure. that. <laughs> yeah, right, Brad. <laughs> You're gonna have to find a dog head. <laughs> I think that would be more unsettling than anything else. Yeah. You know, he, he, you did mention, and you may want to, as as we start to wind this up, that uh, um, that it was almost not going to be a happy ending. Yeah, the Janelle. Um, invited me to to watch uh the the man who invented christmas which is about charles dickens and right. his initial uh um writing of it and apparently assuming that it's true is that ebenezer scrooge was initially not really going to be redeemed it was just you know and you know that's that's what happens you just need to you know learn from this but but uh his his maid was like no anybody can change it, it you have to have him change and honestly there's no way i would read this every year if ebenezer scrooge was the right. same at the end as he was at the beginning so I, and that's one thing i firmly believe is that people can and do change um not very often you know overnight like that but every once in a while and if i, I firmly believe people have the capacity to learn and grow. And sometimes it takes something dramatic, like <laughs> weird ghostly visitors at night, or sometimes it's, you know, a, a tragedy in your life or whatever. But I'm, I'm very grateful that I've been able to make changes in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Any other questions or comments and before we complete? Yeah, Chanel, Chanel, excuse me. We just wanted to say thank you for doing this. The kids have really enjoyed it. And I've enjoyed hearing the actual story. I've, I've only ever watched the movies. Right. Now for everyone, this was still an abridged version. I cut out 10 to 15% of the book. So you should go and read the, the whole thing yourself just to get the little other esoteric things that I, I took out. But uh, yeah, thank you for coming. And also... Um, I messaged Janelle here on the, the, the first author, uh, guest author read up will be Janelle. And we'll be doing that on the 19th of January with her book, King's warrior, which is my favorite. I mean, I, I really like the Zach Bates book, but this is more on the Lord of the Rings side of things. So I, I, I hate to you know, throw Zach under the bus, but I adore King's warrior and yeah. my kids love it too. So <laughs> very great. So stay tuned. We'll get more information anyway. about that. And maybe we can do a short uh, uh, pre pre interview with uh, Janelle to get that out on social media and do what we can to attract more people to to this and more kids, more, more, more kids. You know, 
all the adults are also welcome. And we really encourage, uh, you know, go out on the street and invite a kid to come join you, somebody in the neighborhood that you know well, <laughs> and that would you know, feel good about, you know, being a part of this. Okay, we are done. Uh, thanks, uh, Galen, for your uh, uh, elf on the shoulder, I guess, not on the, on the shelf, but um, may end up going back to the shelf before it's over. Thank you very much, Brad. Have a Merry <laughs> Christmas. Brad. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas. Now go wrap the presents you're supposed to do. <laughs> Bye. Merry Christmas. Christmas wrapping to do. Merry Christmas. Bye, everybody. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you very much. Stay Bye -bye. strong and safe.